Uh, what indeed? Mr. Forces, good old abuse, stupid, terrible, amazing, great, underrated, overrated, terrible Sonic Forces. How dare it exist? It came off of the heels of Sonic Mania in 2017, which was an amazing year for games in general, and people still expected good things from Sonic Team at this point. Lost World was divisive, sure, but it was at worst middling, not hated, but not strongly loved. Sonic Generations and Colors weren't that old at this point, and the last true 3D stinker they made was almost a decade prior to Forces. So the latest Sonic game being the latest Sonic Sonic game was bad enough, but releasing right next to Mario Odyssey, Sonic Mania, and the Ensign Trilogy? That made this sting even harder. What? You're telling me that when you make fans wait four years for the gaming equivalent of less, that people don't want to make a delicious sandwich starring crunchy olives, succulent sheena, creamy mayonnaise, and stale pumpernickel slices of bread? Come on, what kind of fool would defend a symbol of pure evil? This guy. Released in 2017, Sonic Forces was a smashing success. Nope, no, it wasn't. It just wasn't. It just wasn't. The only thing it smashed was my teeth. Don't look at them, I got them fixed at the shop. Don't think about it. At least that's how it felt on launch day. Even now, those feelings of disappointment linger. Thinking about what could have been, no, should have been, really. And although I don't think it was very good, Forces just seems to be one of those games people utterly despise on principle. Like, the idea of Forces is worse than the game itself, to the point that every little thing the game does has to be twisted into being some sort of flaw. Now that's absolutely not to deflect criticism, as it is a really flawed game in a lot of ways, but at least in the Sonic community, it just seems to be really hated, no doubt partially because it's still the last mainline Sonic game. From being compared to 06 to some saying it's the worst game in the series, a complete bastardization of the franchise. Sonic Blast threatens to exist, but that's the hell we want to die on? I mean, I can't blame people for having an opinion, but it's kind of over-exaggerated to act as if it had very few redeeming qualities, if none. My intense hatred for this game has just slowly went away over the years. Because one day, I decided free time sucks and try to 100% the game. The thing is, I even did do it. What I didn't expect is that I started to appreciate more and more about the game. It just reminded me that even in the games you personally loathe, there's a silver lining, whether or not you see it that way. Yeah, your house burnt down and your furniture is shredded and your computer's dead, and you stubbed your toe and you finally disowned you, but hey, at least your walls aren't f***ing orange! Despite how it turned out, I really do think Sonic Bosses did more than a few things right. Things that were often glossed over. While the wrong is gl glossed under, I don't, I don't really know what a gloss is, so. The story was a complete missed opportunity. Some of the characterization is iffy. There was so much automation. It pissed in my cereal. It made it horrible. Unwashable stain on my favorite teach. Why am I defending this game? Alright. Stockholm Syndrome. And saying it's a soulless creation. Come on. A year and a half was not long enough for it to be fully baked. Salmonella's at least two years. Come on, at least reach Salmonella tier. But frankly, I really do think the actual people working on this game cared greatly about where it was headed, trying their best to make it as good as it could be in that time frame. Game development's really not as cut and dry as some people think it is. Hell, this stuck a furry machine in front of millions of Sonic fans. They knew what the fuck they were doing. But what does Sonic Forces do that's socially acceptable? Oh, oh right, uh, besides bullying the mentally ill. First off, recycling, but if it was cool and actually helped humanity. I've seen this stupid fucking hell too many times. In and out of Sonic games, Green Hill has kept rearing its head. For a reason, I, I mean, what other Sonic sages do people even like? There are no fan favorites, no one can decide on anything. We've even been given completely original levels. Inspired by Green Hill, Emerald Hill, Windy Hill, Mushroom Hill, Hank Hill, Bob Hill, Jonah Hill, Hillary Clinton. To be honest with you guys, I think Sega got confused for a while there. 
it's all pretty oversaturated now, and so I, I get why people hate Green Hill's inclusion so much. But let's be honest, if the actual quality of these levels was on par with Generations, would it really be an issue if these were brought back? Mania did the same thing, outright taking gold layouts, and I think it's great, but you didn't see the same belly aching with that game about it being a nostalgic cash grab. The Green Hill name is used here for a reason, and besides just nostalgia. Along with Green Hill, Sega also brought back Chemical Plant and Death Egg. But what did other people think of it? It can't have been that bad, right? I mean, let's take a look. But I don't feel that way. Sonic Force's whole concept is based on the idea of Eggman winning, taking over the world, and ripping off Persona 5. So why not do it before Egg and after Egg? It's less effective to do this with places that are new to everyone. The novelty of seeing this turned into this is more impactful than crap. A car mechanic zone is on fire. We saw it for like a minute in the beginning of the game. But it really is substantially cool that they took these environments and made them different altogether, within its own context and story purpose. And I don't mean stage transitions like Angel Island becoming Australia. The closest thing I can think of is that some Shadow the Hedgehog stages took place in the arc, but those are less a conversion, or just new levels with the same aesthetic. In this particular fashion of taking an old stage into new territory, Territory, it is a special idea. There is one Sonic game out there that probably proves me wrong, I just know it. Everything is peaceful here at the start. You just take a stroll and nothing really happens. But being the only stage before World War 3, that changes quickly. By subverting these stages, Green Hill becomes a breeding ground for weapons and is now brimming with sand. Uh, some guy might have brought that up in the story, I don't know. Metal contraptions and steel platforms have dug into the ground everywhere, pipes are stuck in the environment any way it can. There's cool little details even outside of the actual level design. And gigantic pyramids are overseeing the whole land, each one recording your disgusting failures. Also Lost World Worms here! Lost World Worms! He was never found again. Simply by doing a side-by-side -side look at generations and forces, the clear difference is right there. You have a dead atmosphere with the life drained right out of the grass, which is paler now than it was before. As opposed to how bouncy and lush Green Hill used to be. Basically being told the symbol of the franchise has been gutted by Eggman, and I love it. I'm probably looking a bit deep into it, but they started it. When you are introduced to Chemical Planet and Sonic Forces, it's barely the same zone. It may as well not even be it. I had no clue that's what it was until I actually checked the stage list later on. You could tell me this is an Amazon warehouse, no one would tell the difference. I mean, it's probably safer. But again, this isn't just a reskin of the Generations level. Eggman's expansion has turned this power plant into a spaceport. It's yet another area where you can control the world's resources and methods of transportation. It also hosts a network terminal that you later need to infiltrate. There's actual reasoning at play for each of these old stages being reprised and what role they have. Arsenal Pyramid and Spaceport are conceptually such cool conversions of areas we know and love, and they really help forces come into its own identity. The only one that feels like it really didn't do much with the idea was Classic Green Hill. I like the under area, but Christ, it's so bland. And after the other levels had a twist to differentiate from the original, you expect something, but get nothing. And this whole idea hadn't really been done before. Remakes of old levels have been in Sonic games, sure, but but not old levels being refreshed or repurposed. I'll play Cortex Advocate and say that yeah, they could have not chosen to rehash specifically the popular levels and gone with something else from the franchise. Why do that at all? Why not just make original stages of new locations? But if anything, specifically choosing old locations shows they wanted this game to feel big. So big that it would span past games in its story instead of everything being self-contained. They even reference Seaside Hill. I wouldn't be surprised at how much shit might be on the cutting room floor that they couldn't do because they were likely told it had to come out by a certain time. What's important is that there was a good intention here, where the reasoning simply boils down to the zones being more recognisable rather than them trying to go to nostalgia. Oh, you're telling me people don't remember Pink Banana Zone from an arcade exclusive pinball game no one remembers? Ah, oh, Sega, how could you forget Pink Banana? It's iconic!
the most commonly praised part of the game, Forces really does deserve props for the characterization. His name is Razor, by the way. The R stands for revenge, the A stands for apathy, the, the Z stands for zoo, the O stands for R! Oh, this is so cool! And the R stands for revenge again. This was by far my favorite part of the game, and then you break a few rules against Mother Nature and become Sonic's bestie. Character customization was a blast to play around with. The amount of effort that must have gone into making this much gear for your avatar, alongside the whole game not being a broken mess, in less than a year and a half is crazy. Also kind of mind-boggling that of all things to be fleshed out here, it was the fashion showcase. Because the weird thing is, a lot of this isn't just fodder. You have tons of cool options here. The soap shoes from Sonic Adventure 2, Shadow Scalp, a top hat, mitten, skinwalker, and just so much variety. You can even be a bounce pad. Why? No one knows, but it almost redeems every flaw Forces has, and that's scary. There are reskins and recycled items here and there, sure, but they aren't so constant that it makes putting outfits together a bore. On the contrary, making other with new outfits is legitimately really nice, as it is perfect for younger Sonic fans. Really, what Sonic kid wouldn't love all of this? This homunculus doesn't just look good, it feels good. That's, no, I, I, no, I, I didn't mean it like, besides hitting the trenches wearing a symbol of freedom, some things here do directly impact your gameplay. The variety of wispens, no, sorry, I mean firearms that can shoot, change your two abilities, the main attack, and the color power. This means that changing up your gear lets you discover a different route you wouldn't have been able to go through before, traverse the platforming in a different way, and also changes how you fight. I'm a prof I'm a professional speedrunner, so I know how it goes. <laughs> mistrial, mistrial! Uh... I did it. Yeah, man, second try even. And if you played enough for the game to earn red rings, finish your side missions, get S ranks, whatever, you can also earn better versions of these weapons that have little abilities. It really does go away towards making avatar stages more replayable and enjoyable. Going in with different get-ups letting you experience the level differently is such a cool idea that's still fun to do in practice with what's here. And the kicker is that these changes can let you cut time out on the level, find your own way through when it's not restrictive. Oh, this one lets you run for speed with stomping? Huh. It's actually kind of cool. It's such a great idea, and it just makes me wish that these levels are more fleshed out. Like I said, the Avatar stuff is surprisingly well designed. This all ties together, adding a layer of replayability to levels that aren't too that full in the first place. But even bland stages can be interesting to play when you can decide how your gameplay changes. It's more than just a reskin of Modern Sonic, it's a rebone of Modern Sonic, and something unique. And I haven't even mentioned locking in your bloodline for the Great Race War. Finally! A game for me! They don't drastically alter the gameplay, but uh, being more than an aesthetic is cool. And these qualities even have pinpoint accuracy about nature. Rabbits are known for their invincibility. But of course, in Sega style, they just have to shatter our immersion with this bullshit they made up about cats, which isn't fucking true! Maybe after you collect 10 rings, a local ecosystem is destroyed. That could, I mean, you know, that, could, that could work, and that could be true, but... This... Uh... God, uh, let's just move on. Forces level design was, uh controversial, but I don't think it was necessarily boring all the way through. I mean, this is cool to look at. Well, it's not cool anymore. The question being, is anything here on par with the previous- no, no, come on. It is obviously worse than what came before, embarrassing even, but that doesn't mean there's not good here. Both dumb good and actual good. First of all, Forces suffers mainly because these stages are small. Way, way too small, and to the point that everyone who played Forces was insulted by the length. That's a big reason I used to absolutely despise this game, and Forces is a very unsatisfying one and done playthrough. And these levels just fall short when compared to previous games. I do think smaller and more straightforward level design can be fun, but you have levels that are a pathetic amount of time, paired with a pathetic number of levels. Mortar Canyon is one of those, and deserved so much more. With how many straight lanes are in Forces, just being a little more open feels more special, but also makes this one of the best stages. You're completely free to just fly over this with the boost. You would think that's cheap, but doing this is honestly thrilling. 
Because the important thing is they gave you the choice to approach the level like that. Your hand isn't being held. You can stroll over to this little slidey area, forget the main route and take a right. And even go down to this little side area. And that's here for some reason. How is it they had the time to make this stage so very, but couldn't do the same for every other boost stage? It's like a Sammy Y. It's a fully 3D level along with Arsenal Pyramid. There's also all of this trail platforming, even if in normal play all of that would be negated by a little dash puzzle. That really upsets me because it just kind of encourages boost to win. However, that doesn't mean the rest of the level can't be played differently. There's lots of free jumping and cool boosting opportunities to be seen. It's, it's such a great level and that's continuously fun. How the actual hell did boss levels in this game end up so much more restrained? And at the end of the level, Eggman copy bombs the shit out of the signs, meaning you have to hold your boost in the middle and not get hit instead of blindly running forward. It's a nice little finishing touch. This whole level demonstrates how fun freedom can be in 3D level boost design. It just baffles me how how the same designers can go from missing what people like about the boost style, outright nailing it at some points. Ugh, Sega's Sammy, why? The whole game's level design philosophy just doesn't add up. But besides more, there are other levels that totally made me think, hang on, that was there the whole time? What? It's not just one line? What? I don't need to go into the control problems yet, but on top of that, the core 2D level design really isn't bad for Modern Sonic. It's unfortunate while the good things I talk about have a backhanded negative, but that's just the type of game forces is. Boost levels tend to introduce a little gimmick to stop the actual design from being the same thing with a caught pin. A gear bouncing you up with these stair-like platforms, metropolis with these automatic glitches, giving you a bit of a climb up to the top and breaking the pace. And then it's over in a second, the level finishes, Takashi Zuka goes on Fox News, talks about how revolutionary the next project will be, it's Mega Bloks, everyone cries! Mm -hmm. Willy Wonka's Bleach Factory uses purple water as a means of playing with your timing and patience, punishing you if you screw up. And there really are some cool secrets in these levels, stuff that expectedly cuts your time. It's just weird, and for a game that's so infamous for being linear, there are some really interesting routes here. Now, don't get me wrong, some of these levels truly are nothing, and it doesn't eliminate, you know, this, but it's obvious they wanted to do more. I also want to call attention to Death Prison and Spaceport on a bash fun stages. I really do wish there were more levels like those. From the music pumping you up right from the beginning so you can blast through the facilities. And the actual level length being more than a centimeter long. Avatar stages aren't just a boost to topple the government, like a lot of the modern Sonic stages. There's just a great flow here, even going from 2D to 3D isn't as abrupt as most stages tend to be. And I'd even add Liverpool to that list, although it doesn't quite hit that stride. Something about being able to maintain this speed with a nice hop and continuing to smack robots is really satisfying. Yeah, it's not too depthful, a hard, a worth 30 pounds, and that stops forces from reaching the highs, but it is just dumb fun. That's okay if the levels can feel fulfilled. Kind of summarizes how I feel about a lot of the game and when it lets itself shine. Enjoyable when you aren't thinking about it too much and just keep moving. Just shut up and ignore how all circumstances meant that this game should have been way more competent than it was. Yeah, woo! Even classic Sonic has his moments, which is weird. I'm pretty sure the guy has the most pathways and alternate routes of anyone. For some reason, uh, there just seems to be more opportunities for exploration here. Ghost Town is good, uh, I'll stand by that. You have a loopy loop. Amazing! But seriously, the little secrets, shortcuts, and different routes you can find are really interesting. If you remade this in Mania and maybe remove these stupid springs, I swear it would fit right in. For example, in this little section here, you could easily miss this hole. You can go through to get into a new underground bit, helping you get to the end in a quicker manner instead of having to climb the rooftops or do other platforming. This little slope and chemical plant you can spin dash up to opens up a completely different part of the level you couldn't get to otherwise. It's easy to miss, and even leering off to this area reveals another platform that can get you to a new water segment that eventually drops you right on top of the gold post if you can get through it. The death egg level has a gap at the end of this bridge you can drop dash through that also gets you ahead, that lets you escape capital punishment. And you tell they liked Balmon, but discovering these shortcuts on my own made me appreciate the level design more in general. It really wasn't entirely the one lane experience I thought it was. Why Modern and Avatar had half this much polish in me, I don't know. But that's a lie, because I do know, and it's because those 
plus two require more level design, to compensate for the insane speeds you can reach. It just seems that level design polish was not balanced in all three directions, and clearly runs out of steam in some areas. But, oh well, the hold X parts, the level length, the controls, it does minimise what I'm saying. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is legitimate quality and attention to detail here. It's just so fragmented that the first playthrough will leave a bad taste in your mouth, because of how the game is more designed around and just being an obstacle course speedrunning game than with the difficulty her Sonic games should have. I can't imagine forces wasn't made intentionally easier, and there's actually a harder version of Mortal Canyon in the game's files. And it's because of this fragmentation and legitimate bad level design that became a joke that forces is like a straight line. That's the fatal flaw being that you really can brute force your way through a lot of levels and ignore shortcuts. Yeah, you're taking longer, but it's irrelevant as the core experience was just too easy for almost everyone. Oh wait, I'm supposed to be talking about the good things forces did. Anyway, after you finish the game in 28mm, there is still some story meat to eat. A bit of chicken, a bit of beef, a bit of schizophrenia. You know, all the meats. Episode Shadow was DLC, you know what else was DLC? Insanity! But both were free, and free good. However, this barely counts as DLC. I really do think it was just a cut part of the actual game. It didn't make it in because blah blah development, blah 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 anguish, and you know how it is. But come on, they would never screw up their development again. Like a wise man has said, Sega is known for their honesty. Who cares if that quote came from the company president? Hell, this DLC's original plot plays is actually there on the Spotify track listing. I'm pretty sure that's where a story would have taken place in the base game's narrative. Plot information to fill in a narrative gap, relegated to the Switch eShop, a place no sane human should have to go. Anyway, you get three levels, a Quentin Tarantino movie, even a Sonic reskin. However, this one is completely different. He's slippery! That aside, Shadow's levels are pretty okay, surprisingly. Definitely some of the best stuff in the game. The little additions and changes made to these layouts make a difference in engagement, on top of the fact that it simply doesn't let you spam boost the whole time, it's refreshing to see Episode Shadow correct some mistakes. Trying to S-rank these was surprisingly difficult, far more than the rest of the main game, like it took me so many tries just to crack Schizo Hill. Either way, these are pretty tight levels, so I can deliver a great sense of speed, not feeling too easy. The story was, uh, well, it's definitely a story. But you know what, I'll genuinely compliment how Infinite used Rouge and Omega's voices to trick the player into believing they're real. And screwing with Shadow's head, it's an interesting use of his powers that makes sense with what kind of character Infinite is. As well as that, there's an incomplete arsenal pyramid in the back, it's such a nice detail referencing the named facility still being constructed. Oh, and the remix is made for these three levels. They all bang, but Wide Jungle is definitely my favourite of the three. Directly comparing it to the original song track, it sounds much clearer, with far less foggier production. It shows that difference in Shadow's mindset with what's happening in these two games. In White Jungle, his memory and conviction are a mess. Shadow's mind was hanging by a thread. Oh, I was about to blow. Your lyrics would sound mumble too. But by forces, he's already been convinced of who he is. Therefore, the singing is more pronounced and the instruments are cleaner. It's either a nice touch, a happy accident if they weren't trying to please nerds like me, or both. And speaking of the music. Oh yeah, of course the music notes would be good, it's a Sonic game, shut up! It still deserves a spotlight, especially because from what I've seen, Forces OSD is at an appropriate, proportionate amount of human waste flung at it. Not enough to catch a disease, but just enough for it to be quite the inconvenience. It's not as highly regarded as the Sonic soundtracks, and honestly kind of slept on. <laughs> Which okay, a music preference is hard to really argue against. If you don't like it, I, I wouldn't hurt you. Don't like Castle Miner Z? Haha! <laughs> 
Enjoy the poison. Why don't I explain why I appreciate the soundtrack so much? Even though I get that it's not everyone's cup of tea. It can be very abrasive and harsh at times, so it will rub some the wrong way. Being a different musical direction for Sonic after all. However, I don't think it's fair to say it's random, objectively bad, directionless, or just noise to fill in the gap. All things I've seen said pretty often. No, 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 these characters all have a focus style of music that comes up in their stages. Most of the music in Sonic Forces, unlike most previous Sonic games, is there to embody the gameplay and is specifically more character based this time around. As opposed to something like how Unleashed focuses on culture, which is reflected in the way the levels and hub tracks sound. I'd say it's reminiscent of how Sonic Adventure 2 soundtrack involves. Hell, I could talk about Sonic music for hours, so I'll keep this brief. Modern Sonic's personality is energetic and bold, and hard rock, complemented by a rapid BPM, and sharp synths that sharp represents that. For example, internal network terminal slows that down to show how careful Sonic needs to be as the level is now based around tricky platforming, rather than the assault he was previously doing. You can see this in every one of his tracks. Modern Sonic songs remember to have that gritty synth loitering around. It perfectly embodies boost gameplay and makes for such adrenaline pumping tracks. Being the earlier of the cast, Classic Sonic has a smaller and retro Genesis vibe, updated to the current era. Like Sonic 4, but if they were trying to make music this time. Genre wise, it's pretty much bit pop and takes a cue from old Genesis soundtracks, but doesn't try to sound authentic to that sound chip. Compared to the other musical styles, his music tends to match his less aggressive, bouncier gameplay, and it's just my theory, but Musically, these songs sound like they're trying to embrace how classic Sonic might feel in this situation. None of it outright fits the environment itself, it's like it's more molded upon classic's presence and reasoning for being there. Ghost Town, for example, sounds pretty chaotic, but despite that, there is still a sense of hope and reassurance in some of the song. Like it's trying to say, yeah, Starbucks is on fire, but at least we have Dwarf Sonic. This generally continues with all of his music, with one exception. Yeah, Faded Hills, the song that gaslit everyone into just hating all classic Sonic music in the game. Even songs that really aren't bad have just been overlooked because of association. I just remember hating the classic music because of it, and seeing the light when I took the time to really listen to each tune. Sucks, cause Faded Hills actually has a really nice and fitting melody, but was unfortunately given weird production, and was so jarring it had that off-putting effect on all of the classic music in Forces. I love Cassandra. Casino Forest and Ghost Town in particular, insanely catchy songs, and downright underrated compared to Sonic's whole catalogue of music. And then there's the Avatar who again has his own musical aesthetic, and maybe my favourite style in the whole game. This character is a canvas that doesn't speak, so what the hell could this disgusting hellish homunculus be thinking of right now? They get up going to the club. That hint of dubstep is all over these custom character songs, while obviously not strictly being dubstep. This is straight up EDM, drum and bass even, but I want to highlight the lyrics as they're often overlooked. A fantastic idea, these lyrics exist to portray what the avatar is thinking, how they're feeling, kind of like a mouthpiece. You're literally being burnt by the sun in the last level. So the woman decides to sing about the sun. This is what art looks like. I could go on and on, Moonlight is a great standalone song, but also a beautiful reflection of the stage setting. While telling us how the player character is still trying to find meaning in all of this, trying to reach the end. The first level's lyrics even reference the light 
of Hope, which is the game's vocal theme. It's a small little way of tying it together. Man, there's not a single song here that I haven't obsessed over. Oh, and the hybrid levels too, those are music to reflect both characters' musical styles. Take an Arsenal, Pyramid is an example, it's very rocky. One of my favourite anime openings in recent years. With that energetic tone, blend of real instruments and aggressive piercing synths, it embodies the same life and feel songs like Sunset Heights gave us. And a fun fact, I'm pretty sure this whole section is meant to be a reprise of a little song you might know from Sonic 06. I mean, I, I definitely hear it. And the music that plays when you enter the pyramid to take it out from the inside mages up the soundtrack. It's more akin to... What do you know, the Avatar's musical style. Fidel Judgment also does this with both tracks. That reminds me, we really, really deserved more hybrid levels. I don't even need to go into how good the rest of the music is. Infinite's themes, fist bump, the final boss's third phase, god. I just really love how the soundtrack overall has this kind of uh, industrial feel to it. Sonic Force's music was done insanely right, and I unashamedly think it might be one of the best soundtracks in the series. Yeah, it could be cheesy and corny, but what is this franchise if not that? There are smaller things this game did right. Objectives and endpoints that directly tie into the narrative, either leading you straight into what the next level is going to be about, or showing you something necessary for the story. Whatever, the point is you aren't just hitting a goalpost, or popping a container, or like an idiot, like a fool. Okay, I mean sometimes you're a fool, but that, 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 that doesn't count. This is just a cool little detail that connects the gameplay to the plot. Also something that was absent in many modern Sonic games. Infinite fights, changing the arena when you you get hit by illusions, which open up a new, harder pattern as a punishment for touching the PS1 strawberries. There's also some really cool little visual details, like how when the crab bot notices you, he then ascends and pounces on the avatar in Guardian Rock. Or, looking into the distance, seeing that decimated bridge and realizing they actually place the bridge's debris in various positions throughout the level. Speaking of photosynthesis, to help show how the land decayed, there are dried up, shattered flowers in Green Hill that play a different, almost sad animation as opposed to the normal flowers that spin around with vibrance. I really like that and I wouldn't have noticed if it wasn't for Twitter. Also the occasional dialogue from Sonic and friends about the situation during the level, what this side of the fire looks like, it's a pretty cool feature. The radio dialogue in the background, the stage feels a bit more action oriented, you know? Kinda makes it seem as if you really are on a mission for the resistance. It also helps you stay connected to the overarching plot and the cast of characters. I genuinely love it, but it's also cool that you're still allowed to turn it off if it annoys you. Covering the drop dash into classic Sonic and the saving grace to make its gameplay far more bearable. Also, including the Mania Jump animation. This stuff really makes it feel like it's Mania Sonic. Yeah, no, uh, props to whichever severely underpaid animator did that. And finally, while most of the bosses are really thrilling to come back to, leading the shittiest, crappiest boss into the f***ing Egg Dragoo is genuinely a charming little guy. It gave me a chuckle, cause it just comes out of nowhere. And each separate phase of the final boss, ramping everything up with a unique section to eventually build up the holy threesome. And it's easily the best Sonic Colors boss. I, even when I hated this game, I loved that moment. Yeah, no, that's all I got. Damn. Uh, th oh, the, the monkey feet. I love the monkey feet. Yeah, nothing Well, I know it seems like I'm the president of the Sonic Forces fan club, but seriously? I really don't love it, or hate it, but is it a bad game? I mean, I don't think it is. I just appreciate the sparks here, even if it doesn't come together to be a Sonic game of the quality fans deserve. But yeah, I don't have much else positive to say about it. Actually, after thinking about it, I'm kind of just annoyed at all the lost potential the game had. I empty my stomach of light, only to find darkness. There's some kind of medical issue. I, we, we don't know what the problem is. I might need surgery, but... But! Saying what Sonic Forces did wrong might help. <laughs> I don't know. It's a gut feeling. There is something very wrong happening down there. Oh, oh, oh I have to bitch. Oh, it's a necessary evil.